Well, good morning, guys. It was about 15 years ago that I got invited to jump into a flight simulator. You ever been in one of those things before? It's incredibly cool. All you pilots out there, thank you for being pilots, and thank you for not allowing me to be a pilot. Like, as I was in there, it was super fun. I'm doing barrel rolls, and this is a guy at our church. He said, come down, I bought this new toy, and he had this whole thing set up in Orange County, and, and it was amazing to me how many times I crashed. Like, I didn't know it was possible to be that bad at something, right? And, and part of it is you get in, and you get flying, and you literally lose orientation. Like, you start going around and getting up and down, and you start to not understand what's up, what's down, what's right, what's left. And it gave me a great appreciation and a great fear for every time I get on an airplane for the rest of my life, right? It reminds me of Dallas Willard. He wrote this in Divine Conspiracy. He said, recently, a pilot was practicing these high-speed maneuvers in a jet fighter. She turned the controls for what she thought was a steep ascent, and she flew straight into the ground. She was unaware that she had been flying upside down. This is a parable of human existence in our times, not exactly that everyone is crashing, though there is enough of that, but most of us as individuals and world society as a whole, we're living at this high speed, often with no clue whether we're flying upside down or right side up. Indeed, we are haunted by a strong suspicion that there may be no difference, or at least that is unknown or irrelevant. I think that's an incredible parable for our time, do you? Like we're running around, we move at these high speed paces to different places, and the question is how easy would it be for us to be flying our life, flying our plane, and not know, and next thing you know, you run to the ground. See, here's one of my greatest fears. We don't know we're flying upside down often until we meet Jesus face to face. But we're pursuing these things that we think, and again, when you're flying upside down and everyone around you is flying upside down, you think that's the norm. And yet we've been looking at this book of John where I feel like he's been using Jesus' words to tell us here's what the good life is and what's so difficult about pursuing the good life is it's gonna look countercultural, totally the opposite of what everyone else and everything else is happening around us. And so I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful for the spirit of God that speaks to us as we read it so that we might understand how could we as Christians, who again, I think live in a society of everyday people that are actually flying the wrong direction, and this leads to tragic consequences. In fact, here's my summary statement for today. The Jews and the disciples, they're trying to figure out what's the imminent and really the imperative implications of who this Jesus is and what his kingdom is all about. What does it matter that Jesus is here? What do these words mean for me in my flight that I call life? And all too often we can be flying upside down and yet it feels like we're right side up and everybody's doing it and it just feels like we're going with the flow, but what if the flow was leading us to crash? What if the flow was not actually leading us to the good life, it was actually the opposite of what Jesus wanted for us? And please hear me, often we don't necessarily recognize that things are off until things get really, really bad, like COVID. Church, I don't want us to miss, I think COVID was a huge opportunity, and since it's not gone, the opportunity hasn't left us either. To stop and to evaluate, what are we doing with our life? Are we pursuing the good life? Because that's what Jesus offers. See, this reality will lead to tragic consequences if we're flying upside down, but spiritually, flying right side up, I believe offers eternal satisfaction. And so last week was the bread of life is he who satisfies our hearts and our souls and our hunger pains that we might never thirst or hunger again. And so this week we're building on what's the results of last week's text, of Jesus offering us to go. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter six. We're gonna pick it up in verse 59. This is this pivot verse from last week into this week. John six fifty nine says this, and Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he was teaching at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a really hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? See, it's the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it would be that would betray him. And he, Jesus said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned his back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? 
Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed, we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so Jesus answered them, and yet did not I choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is the devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. Spirit of God, as we read this text today, we ask that you would speak to us that you would fill our hearts and our minds with the truth of what it looks like to be flying upside down for your kingdom's purposes, that you would protect us from our flesh, that you would protect us from the world around us, and that you would remind us that you have overcome the enemy, and that truly, Jesus, that your better is better. So as we pursue you today, would you speak for your glory and for our good? Would you help us to hear you and to listen? And everybody said, amen. Now, I want to kind of remind us where we've been and where we're going. Chapter 6 has been this incredible chapter. Definitely one of my favorite chapters in John. Now, you remember, that's always just whatever chapter we're in right now, right? But it's been incredible. Jesus is teaching us in such a way so that we might not be flying upside down. He's giving us opportunities to believe that his better is better, to put our trust in him, to treasure him, to be the one that will actually satisfy us. So four weeks ago now, Jesus fed the 5,000. If you remember, at the end of that feeding in chapter 6, verse 15, the people around him were like, let's go take him and make him king because he's going to fix our life. He's going to make our lives better. And Jesus is like, yes, I am. I'm going to give you the good life, but not the way that you think, not what you want. You're flying upside down. So he goes away. He retreats. The disciples go. They go fish, and they're looking for him. And then Jesus meets them in the midst of the storm, and he calms the storm. He removes them out of the storm. He gets them to to promised land, safe land. That's what Jesus does. And then last week, I talked specifically about what is the Jews' response. So you remember last week, the Jews show up and they find Jesus and they say this, Jesus, we got this question. And Jesus almost rudely doesn't answer their question, remember? He says, you want to talk about physical things. I want to talk about eternal things. You want to talk about your hunger pains. I want to talk about something that will help you to never hunger or thirst again. And the Jews are like, well, well, give us that. That sounds good. I want that meal. And Jesus goes on and he explains. He uses the metaphor that my body is going to be the flesh that you must eat. You must remove your body. He's not even necessarily talking about communion. He's talking about substitution here. He's talking about this new life that you must abide in me. And so the disciples are totally confused. Now, remember the term disciple just means follower. How big is the following of Jesus right now? Anybody remember he fed how many people? Oh, church, that's very disappointing. Very, because it's literally on the screen and I just said it. I get it's not in yellow, okay? How many people did he just feed? 5,000. And that was the men. So with women and children, who knows, 15, 20, some people say 12, a lot of people. Jesus' following is big. See, in an upside down world, if we are flying upside down, we think bigger is always better, do we not? Jesus wants to know if the following is true, not if it's big. Jesus is looking for who are his true disciples that actually understand who he is, understand what life in this upside down kingdom is. And just speaking from the flight simulator guy, you should never let me fly your airplane. It's so confusing. And so he's helping us rethink our thinking. What does kingdom living actually look like? And so there's a lot of people, but how many actually understand? I don't think as many as we might believe. I think that's true today too. And so again, it's important that as we look at this text, we see the Jewish crowd last week as Jesus clarifies for them, and they're like, just help me understand, what do you mean eat of your body and drink of your blood? What do you mean by that? He's like, I mean eat of my body and drink of my blood, metaphorically. And they don't get it. And that's what we're picking up. We're picking up the text from last week where the Jews, the large crowd of people, he's been teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum, all these people are following. This might be the climax of Jesus' ministry so far if climax meant large. And that's what we see starting now in chapter 6, verse 59. Here's the text. I am the bread of life. That was last week's statement. The first of the seven I am's in the gospel of John. It's another transition verse here in 59, just like 6.1 and 6.15, and then the paragraph of 22 and 24. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he was teaching at Capernaum. And when many of his disciples heard this, now disciple means follower, a lot of people. not talking about the 12. We're going to see them in a couple of verses. When many of the crowd, the disciples, the Jewish crowd heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. What's the this? I'm the bread of life. Jesus, what do you mean by that? Help me understand. What are you inviting me into today? What does it mean to eat of your flesh, to drink of your blood? And he gave us an indicator, if you remember last week, abide in me, obey me, trust that my better is better. 
Trust me, treasure me. And so the disciples heard this and they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Remember chapter six, verse 17, the disciples are in the dark. They don't understand, it's not complete, it's not all the way there, but we're gonna see some disciples do, but the majority of the disciples, they say this is hard to understand, we don't understand, and so Jesus knows this. Here's the beauty of Jesus, Jesus doesn't ever get frustrated with us and give up on us. Is that good news, church? Like, how many of you deserve to be given up on? Can we just buy a show of hands? At home, too. How many of you guys do? Like, yes, this is what I joke about. These are two-hand people, right? Like, we're not faithful. What has Jesus been doing for the last two-something years? Miracles, teaching. Remember, vision is caught, it's not taught. So Jesus isn't anti-teaching. He teaches, but some of the best teaching that Jesus did was around the campfire, It was through these great miracles. At the end of the miracle, Jesus would say, no, 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 it's not about this bread and this fish. It's about food so you never hunger again. He was always pulling us out of our tendency to fly upside down. Now, please hear me. I think that's the result of the fall. I I don't think that that's something that we can just look at and say, well, how did we start doing this? Go read Genesis 3. That's how it started. We created a culture and a system where, remember, the, the stool, the throne of our heart, we not got off the throne of our heart. We put ourselves in the captain's chair. That's what we did. We took control, and as a result, we've been living this life, pursuing our own definition of the good life, and so Jesus is offering a new way of life, a new kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth where he's taking us. And so Jesus knows that the disciples, they're grumbling about this. Remember, he he knows. He knows what's going on in our hearts. He knows that it's not just lip service, what we think we say, what we actually say. He wants to know what's going on in your heart. And so Jesus, knowing these things, he says, hey, do you take offense at this? Now, some of you have wondered, do I actually find joy in offending you? Can I just be very, very clear here? No. It's not my joy to offend people. Someone said, you really don't care if we're comfortable. Remember we used to have those metal chairs at Marina Middle School? Who misses those chairs? Anybody? I was talking to the Waysners. They've been here since day two, right? Like, do you miss those chairs? Not at all. Man, I miss them. There's this part for me that says the more comfortable we get this side of heaven, the more we forget that this place isn't our home. The more comfortable that we get, and so if comfort is the goal, it means we're flying upside down. And by the way, will comfort save us when life is over? No, I actually think comfort can trap us. And so just note this, Jesus says, do you take offense at this? If we get offended by the right things, that's a good thing. Someone say amen. Two of you, I just wanna know who I can offend. If we get offended by the right thing, it's a good thing. And so when Jesus shows up, he's just simply saying this, look, you're flying upside down. You might be caught off guard by this. It might bother you, but I'm not worried about that. Because the reality is I care about your heart enough to have the hard conversation to help coach you into seeing what you are really designed to live and to experience. And he says this, look, you take offense at me offering you bread so you'll never hunger or thirst again. You don't understand, but I want you to understand. I want you to get this, I want you to fly rightly because once you crash your plane into the ground because you're flying upside down, it's too late. So Jesus says, look, you take offense at this, well really, what else? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? In fact, what's gonna happen at Jesus' great ascension? What is his ascension? Going up to what? Where does he go at the end of his life? He goes up to the cross. He goes, you think you're offended now by the whole bread of life thing? Imagine how offended you'll be when the king of the Jews lays down his life and doesn't bring political revolution. Imagine how offended that you'll be when I actually say, no, I'm gonna trust the Father's will. I'm gonna physically lay my life down to serve and to die. How offended would you be if that was your king? Now we know how offended are the Jews at Jesus' life and death. They're offended, that's why they kill him. He doesn't give them what they want. He's offering them what they need. So Jesus simply says this, he says, you think you're offended now? I'm gonna offend you way more later. You want political revolution and I'm gonna change the world, but I need you to fly right side up to actually see this. So here's the fallout of this dispute. He says, it's the spirit who gives life. It's really the only time we see spirit and flesh combined in John's gospel, except for that guy Nicodemus in chapter three, remember? Chapter three, verse six, we see this parallel here from verse 63, the spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. When you're flying upside down, you don't know it. You're so discombobulated, you don't actually know what's up and down and what's gonna make me happy and what's not. And so what do we do as humanity? We pursue the things that we think will make us happy until we find out that they won't and then we pursue something else. That's what we do. We're all fair weather fans, are we not? We're pursuing the things that we think will make us happy until they don't. Here's what Jesus says. You don't have a clue. You're going to continue to pursue these things. What you need is life, and life comes from the Spirit. 
Life comes from my words. Remember chapter one, the word became flesh. Jesus says, I'm here, I'm giving you the words, I'm teaching, I'm talking, I'm helping you see what truth is, I'm helping you see how you can fly differently, but they don't understand. He says, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Verse 64, a very discouraging verse, but there are some of you who do not what? Believe. Why did John write this book, chapter 20, verse 31? So that we might what? Believe. But, but what we believe matters. Not just that we believe, but that we believe in Jesus as the son of God, that we believe that Jesus is the giver of the good life. That's what he's offering us. He's offering us to rethink our thinking, to get off the throne of our hearts and say, God, I believe in you, I trust in you. That only happens because the spirit gives life. That's the only way that happens is the spirit, I want this. Now, John gives us this like parenthetical thought, and I love this verse. It helps us see who Jesus is as he submits himself to the father. Here's what John writes. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would, those who were and who did not believe and those who it was that would betray him. Judas he's talking about. We're gonna see that in a couple of verses. Now, I love this truth because I don't know about you, but when you speak passionately to a friend or a family member, when you share the gospel, when you tell your children, don't run in the street, it's really bad for you because cars go flying around and when your kid goes running in the street, how do you feel? Does anyone else get frustrated at their kids when they don't listen? Is it just my kids that don't listen? Is there any, I mean, I need a little audience participation. Thank you, Jen. Anybody else have a hard time? And again, I'm not telling my kids things because I'm this evil dictator. I'm telling it them because I love them, because I care about them. And so if they choose to not listen, it's discouraging. Now, I don't necessarily yell, but can it be discouraging? It can be like, guys, I want this for you. So what has been happening in Jesus' ministry so far? There's this huge success rate of people coming, of people following. What's gonna happen in a couple of verses is they're all gonna take off. And I think it'd be tempting for him to be discouraged, but why is Jesus not discouraged? Because it's the Father's plan. Now this is really important because there's times that we talk to people, like I have talked to so many, it's almost baseball season, so many Dodger fans about the better way of life. So many of you, and it's so discouraging, you can't get out from your Southern California roots. And I'm trying to say, you live in the Bay Area. There's a better way of living. Now again, please hear me, obviously I'm joking here, but we're talking about life and death, we're talking about eternity, we're talking about joy everlasting. So when Jesus says, from the beginning, the Father told him who would believe and who would betray him, I think this is huge, because I tend to get discouraged when people settle for lesser joys. I think that's a part of humanity. I think that's probably a good thing that we get discouraged when people settle for lesser joys. It allows us to stay engaged, to stay praying and watching and stepping, but don't miss this. This is about them and Jesus. And so notice here, Jesus releases them to the Father. This is huge, because if you're like me, you're like, man, I just want better for them. I just don't want them to settle for less. And yet Jesus says, look, God already told me he's in charge. My job's to be faithful. Anyone need to hear that word this morning? Our job is to be faithful to pray, to watch, to step, but we don't save people. Jesus actually does, and yet he surrenders to the Father. So this is a huge parenthetical thought that John gives us, verse 65, and he then said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. It's this repeat of verse 44. He says, God the Father is in charge, he makes no bad choices, and he's wooing us as his children to come back home. We have no control when they come home, how they come home, if they come home. But as loving brothers and sisters, what do we want for our family and our friends? For them to come home. And so we teach and we preach and we live for the kingdom of God, even when it doesn't make sense to the outside world. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. I think we need these words of Jesus. He knew who would reject, he knew who would accept, he trusts the Father. I think that's what he says even to the disciples, dust off your feet, right? And they, they don't accept you, dust off your feet, move on. There's other people that need to hear. There's other people that God wants. And so when sinners act like sinners, unbelief is normal. As I was meditating this week, sinners, all of us left to our own choices. You know what we're always gonna choose? Sin. We're always gonna choose sin. We're gonna choose sin to satisfy us. We're gonna settle for lesser joys. And so look at the heart of God. Look at the sovereignty of God. God says this, look, I'm gonna choose you, but I want you to choose me. And I understand not all of you will. And so as Jesus says these things, verse 66 to me is one of the saddest verses in all of the gospel. Here's what the text says. After Jesus says this, look, I know some of you are going to reject, but I'm still offering you eternal life. I'm still offering you the bread of life. I'm giving you my life. Here's what we see. And after this, many of his disciples turned their backs and they no longer walked with him. Can 
Guys, I think we get excited about all sorts of silly things in this world. We get excited about sports. I'm, I'm, not, I'm a fan of sports. We get excited about homes and money. We get excited about relationships. This is it. This is why we exist as a church, to enjoy God together and to invite other people. But make no mistake, more often than not, you know what people will do when they respond to Jesus? They will turn their back and no longer walk with him. And we have to just mourn this verse. It's important for us. It's important for us to stop and just say, man. Now, we don't give up. We're not fatalists. We know that God is sovereign. We know that God's in control. We know that God's not done. Because if he was done pursuing humanity, guess what? We'd be done. Don't lose heart. That's why he just doesn't lose heart. He trusts the Father. But there's people in all of our lives, and we think that they're turning their back. Don't give up. I don't think God's given up on them. But also understand, sinners will choose sin 10 out of 10 times unless God gives them new life. Because we're flying upside down and we don't even know it. We're living in this world where we're discombobulated and we're settling for less. And so what does flying upside down look like? And, and as I was reading and reflecting, and I read a lot of stuff this week, here's what one of my buddies said it this way. He says it this, believe that the gadgets and gizmos provide the greatest satisfaction. You know where that comes from? Gadgets and gizmos, uh, what? Nobody knows Ariel? Ariel was a prophet in The Little Mermaid. I want more. Man, I'm sad. All you 70s and 80s children, I know that's the majority of our church, so come on. And so here's the reality. We believe in this upside down world that we're living as we're flying. We believe that gadgets and gizmos will make us happy. How do we spend our time and our talent and our treasure? On gadgets and gizmos. Now, please hear me. I'm not trying to beat us up. I think the Jews were in the exact same boat. Don't miss this. They were like, man, the Romans, they're oppressing us. We need to be set free. That's why they wanted to get Jesus to make him king, right? There will be less taxes. There will be better houses. We'll be having, we'll have faster camels, <laughs> right? Like that's what they're looking for. They're looking for things on this side of heaven. And Jesus says, guys, I'm coming to help you see you're flying upside down. You're literally praying for all the things that will take you further away from my kingdom, not more in my kingdom. And so I think we're flying upside down. We believe that these things on this side of heaven will actually make us happy. Remember, Jesus identified that. He said, you came to me not because the signs I did, but because you saw me feed your bellies. Do a healthy evaluation of our prayer life, of our budgets, of our words, of our times, of our joy. What makes us happy? That's going to show you where your heart is. It's going to show you what sits on the throne of your heart. The second thing I think flying upside down is that we have a tendency to believe that the worldview that we were raised with is inevitably true and correct. Jesus shows up. Jesus is not against Moses. He's a fan of Moses. He made Moses. He created Moses. And he used Moses. But remember, they were like, man, Moses, he fed us. He's like, Moses didn't feed you. My father from heaven, he fed you through Moses. See, I think so often we forget that we think that what we believe is determined from where we were born. What if you were born into a different religion? It's why I, my, my skin kind of crawls, my heart kind of shirks when people say, well, I was born a Christian. You weren't born a Christian, you were born a sinner. Made in the image of God in Genesis 1:26, but you were born a sinner that was flying upside down. And so Jesus comes to give them truth so that the truth will set them free. And he actually offends their religion because their religion was Moses. And he says, no, 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 you need to meet father of Moses. Church, don't miss this. You're not a Christian because you were born to Christian parents. When you meet Jesus face to face and he says, why should I you into my heaven? And you're like, well, my dad was a pastor. Well, I went to Vintage Grace. Well, I sat in the front row. So what? So what? Jesus is messing with their religion because their religion was works righteousness. That was the Jewish religion. If I do enough, if I please God, and if I mess up, I give a sacrifice and I do more. And Jesus says, you don't need a sacrifice. You need the sacrifice. The only way you're going to get right standing with my father is if you go back to garden living. The only way you get back to garden living is if you get off the throne of your heart and you let me take my seat. And so again, flying upside down, I think it's a world that we live in and it'd be easy for us to get distracted by the things of this world and even by religion. And so Jesus, I think, offends the Jews' religion. Now the irony, of course, is that he's the God of the Jews. <laughs> Don't miss this. But what we believe is rooted in why we believe it. 
And that's what matters here. He says this, you can't just believe that the worldview you were raised with is inevitably true and correct. You actually have to believe that Jesus is the Lord of your life. The third way I think that we fly upside down for us today is that we believe that peace is the absence of any tension. We talked about this last week, our fifth value as a church that we embrace inevitable tensions. Did God choose you or did you choose God? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. And I'm saying it over and over again because I think that again, heresy comes from picking one over the other and God tells us it's both and, it's not either or. I think that we live in a world where we want everything to fit in our little box. If God could fit in your box, how big would God be? Not very big, not very worship worthy. Doesn't mean we don't think rightly. It doesn't mean we don't think hard. It doesn't mean we don't go to life group when we don't understand the text and try to figure out. But make no mistake, this world is full of tensions and way too often we try to solve them instead of worshiping the God that created them. That's good, write that down. It's not in my notes, that must have been the spirit. No, seriously, like too often we're like, I'm gonna figure this out. And God's like, you can't figure me out. You're made to worship me. Worship. The fourth one is this. We believe that following Jesus is gonna be what? Easy. Who picks the hard way? I mean, you got issues, right? Like I avoid pain at all costs. I get a hangnail and I cry, right? And you only laugh because you know it's true. We live our life to insulate ourselves from trials and tribulations, and yet when Jesus says, follow me, does he say, you know, COVID's not gonna affect Christians in 2021. Cancer, that's not a part of Christianity. Difficult marriages, piece of cake, just be a Christian. Once you become a Christian, everything's easy. Jesus literally promised us the opposite, and yet in our world, what have we created? We've created this easy believism. We've created this, there is no tension. The, the, the seven happy steps to a happy, healthy, wealthy life. Guys, none of that is found in this book. There's one step found in this book. Get off the throne, repent, and give me my seat. Then you'll get the good life. It's not that God doesn't want you to have the good life. It's just so different than what we expect because we're flying upside down. Does that make sense? And on some level, it makes sense. On another level, it doesn't. That's why we come to church every week. It's why we go to life group on Tuesday nights because we have to fight for our joy because how do we live in this kingdom world while still having one foot in the empire? Because everyone around us is flying upside down with this being their beliefs. But church, Jesus confronts these in the gospel of John and I pray that he's been confronting them in our hearts too. So bad news, John 6, 6, 6, good news, verse 6, 7. So then Jesus says to the 12, now again, that's the first reference of the 12 in the Gospel of John. So before, it was the crowd, lots of disciples. What does he want for the disciples? He wants them to believe. So here's what we see. So Jesus then says to the 12, do you want to go away as well? He says, look guys, I'm really good at being like the anti-church growth God. Think about that at this point, right? Because again, we live in this world where church growth, how do we get more people here? How do we do it bigger? How do we do it better? Church, that has never been our heart as elders and leaders at Vintage Grace. Now, please hear me. We want as many people to respond to the gospel as possible, but not an easy believism because that is no believism. We want them to count the cost. So Jesus says, hey, here's the good news. People are counting the cost. And guess what? They're leaving. He's not discouraged. He's not depressed. He's persevering, he's stepping on, he's stepping out, and he still wants people to follow him, but he goes to the 12 and he says, hey, now's a good time. If you wanna bail, the doors are wide open. You'll just blend right into the crowd like everybody else flying upside down. The way that this grammar is structured, he says, do you wanna go away as well? That question is said in such a way that Jesus is expecting them to say, no way, let's stay, let's go. So again, Jesus is asking the question, he's given the opportunity, but he's saying it in such a way where he's like, I hope that you stay, I actually expect you to stay. You've been with me for all this time. Please hear me, COVID has revealed cracks in our faith. That's not a bad thing, we already had them. Now we just repent of them and say, God, fill the space. But again, make no mistake, people, you read Barna, you read church guides, you read church growth people, you read all these quote unquote experts, people are leaving the faith right now. Guys, they probably were never in the faith. But right now we get to be revealing what is our faith in? What's our definition of the good life? Are we flying upside down? All right, so Jesus says to 12, do you want to go away as well? And I love Simon. He's the spokesperson. We love Simon Peter, right? Because he makes us feel good about ourselves. I love this boy. Again, he's trying his best. It's like one step forward, seven back. Like this is Simon Peter. He's like, I got you guys. He looks around. Anyone want to take this one? Okay, I'll go. Simon answers him, Lord, to where should we go? Now, I don't know about you, 
and I don't think this is what Simon means, but this just reminded me like in junior high, I'm not saying you would have ever done this. I don't think I did, but maybe I did. It's a great pickup line. Hey, you want to go out? Sure. Why do you want to go out? Well, there's nobody else here. (laughs) Think about that. It's just you and me. So I guess we should date. I don't think I ever used that line, but that's what Peter says, right? He goes, Jesus just says, if you want to go, you can go. He's like, well, where else can we go? Like, there's nobody else here, Jesus. I don't actually think that's what Peter says, but it sure sounds like that. Well, there's no better options. No, Peter does say, no, no, no. You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now that's a phrase. If you want to go read the book of Isaiah, it's all over. I love this. The Holy One of God, the Holy One of Israel. Jesus says, I'm the Holy One of Israel. I showed up and Peter says, I see it and I believe it. Is that not what Peter has been trying to follow Jesus to understand? I believe it. I believe that you are who you say you are and regularly this is used in a negative way like in Mark or Luke, the demons say it to Jesus. You're the Holy One of God. Here it's a positive term. Peter says, Jesus, I believe that you are king. That's what he says. I believe that you're king. I'm going to stop flying upside down because of it. And again, this is a a huge moment because some of the 12 believe, but not all the 12. Because even when it's the holy ones, even when it's the set apart ones, even when it's the 12, there's this OST, this ongoing spiritual transformation of getting off the throne of our heart, of saying, God, take the cockpit, otherwise I'm going to fly us into the ground. Jesus answered them, did not I choose you, the 12? So again, you see the tension, God's sovereignty, human responsibility. Peter responds faithfully to God, but only because God chose him. But Peter responds, but God chose, I chose you and the 12, and yet one of you is the devil. I don't know about you, but that also feels like a really bad pickup line, right? He's talking to the 12, everyone's left. They could be feeling like, we're pretty good. We're the faithful ones. We got Peter, he's leading the way. We're following Jesus. He just goes, actually, even in the 12, one of you is gonna betray me. In fact, who else does Jesus call the devil at one point? Peter. Peter, he says, Peter, knock it off. Get behind me, Satan. Why? Because the reality is this, anytime we're not for God, we're representing Satan. That's the truth of it. Peter does it, you do it, I do it, Judas does it, yet one of you is the devil, and he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. So on one level, you get this bad news text, good news, and then where do we end? Man, will someone preach a good text? Maybe next week will be better. We're gonna see the brothers of Jesus. Maybe they'll understand who Jesus is. Again, real quick, they don't. Church, we gotta be patient with each other and with our friends and with our family because we're all in this process of sanctification. We're all in this process of recognizing that we're flying upside down. We're all in this process of saying, God, I believe, but help me in my lack of belief. I believe that you're the bread of life, the light of the world, the the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way, the truth, the life, the true vine. But let's be really honest, in all of these beliefs, Lord, we need you to help us with our lack of belief. Every one of us. Judas, Peter, you, me, we're in this process. So what are the implications? The implications are that we would believe. One of my most faithful prayers in my quiet closet, prayer closet with the Lord is simply this, Lord, I believe, help me with my lack of belief. Lord, I believe that you're better is better. And yet every time I make a choice to fly upside down, I'm actually combating that reality. But these are written so that you might believe that he is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in the good way. And the way that we think determines the way that we live. So church, this is why we focus on the word of God, not on pop culture, not on what will make us happy. The word of God actually does give us the good life actually does make us happy. And so I've got four things. How do we combat this flying upside down? Here's the first one. We have to believe that the good life is only found spiritually. We have to stop for a moment and do a healthy inventory of our heart and actually say the only thing we want to spend our time and our talent and our treasure on is spiritual and eternal. Now again, if we actually do a legitimate inventory of our heart, how's that gonna make us feel? Well, y'all are gonna be offended. Because I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, it's so easy to go with the flow and to get distracted by this world. It's so easy to want the faster camel, is it not? It's so easy to say that, well, if I just create my life in such a way, I'll be insulated from the realities of this world and I start to literally spend my time, my waking efforts and energy on a lot of things that at the end of the day are gonna burn and are gonna expire. We invest in bread that, again, thankfully is not still here because it would just be moldy. 
And so church, what do we believe? Do we believe that the good life is only found spiritually? Which means I hope you're in the room right now because you do believe that, amen? Remember, amen means I agree and that you're not sleeping. That's what it means. But, but here's the deal. Do we believe that good life is only found spiritually? And if you're like me, you're gonna say yes. And then this afternoon you're gonna be like, ugh. Dang. How easily we're distracted. Repent of that. The second one is this. Do we believe that Jesus' kingdom worldview is correct and it's the only way to live? Not because grandma said so. Again, I'll never forget being a college pastor. I had so many parents, they were so upset with me as a college pastor because I was causing their kids to lose their salvation. And I'm like, no, 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 they're just thinking about it for the first time. It's a beautiful thing. And if we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, now's a great time to be thinking about it. What became clear as I was sitting with this woman, it was just that she's like, I don't know if I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. See, we gotta challenge our belief because if it's true, it's gonna stay true because it's true because truth is not determined by a season. Truth is determined outside of the circumstance. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's not because you were born that way, but it's because it's true. And often in Jesus' kingdom, do you recognize this? That we're gonna actually be winning, but it's gonna feel like we're losing? I mean, think about the garden, right? Peter knucklehead, right? He comes back out and again, the, the, the servant shows up and but it's Peter, he pulls out his sword. He's like, Jesus, I got you. We're gonna win this battle. And what does Jesus say? Put the sword away. You're staying on this plane. I wanna look vertical. And on this plane, it might look like we're gonna lose sometimes because Jesus came to lay his life down. He came as a servant to serve the world and to be a ransom for many. That doesn't feel like winning, does it? Jesus was trying to prepare them for the cross. At the cross, at that moment, everyone felt like Jesus lost. And yet the reality is Jesus was overcoming the grave in just three days, amen? So we have to recognize this reality in this upside down kingdom of God, that he comes to lay down his life, that less is more, there's a different scoreboard. I had a dear friend of mine just send me an email recently as she was wrestling, I think really with point two and point three. We have to believe that peace is found in embracing the appropriate tensions of kingdom living in this empire world. And so she sent me this email. Again, this was one of our former secretaries at a church I served at about 20 years ago. This was a girl that would have been in, in one of our youth groups for me and, and my wife. And she was telling this story about how God's better is better, about what God invites her into. I love hearing Vintage Grace lines in other churches. It's so fun because it just comes straight from the word of God. And she told the story of her daughter that truly lived the prodigal. That again, she got the phone call from the prison of her daughter that again, after drugs and pursuing the world, believing that that would make her happy, she got the phone call that no mom wants to get, right? That says, hey, I'm actually gonna go to prison. This is, this is the time, now it's hard time. I'm gonna be gone. And oh, by the way, at the end of the phone call, I'm pregnant also. I mean, what's that like for the church secretary? Okay, I know God's better is better. Help me in my disbelief. Help me live in this tension of God's sovereign human responsibility. Help me live in this tension of being in the kingdom, but also a resident of the empire. How do I do this? And so she shared this testimony to her church back in January of 2020. It was, it was this testimony of saying, God, how do I trust you? But I do because I know that you're faithful. Because I know that your better is better. Because I know that in the empire, we're going to have setbacks, but they're only setups for kingdom movement and kingdom living. She shared that testimony with me because she got to help raise her little child, her grandchild, Silas. She shared that because it was actually just this last week that Silas, three years old, passed away and died unexpectedly. Guys, it gets to point four. Believe that following Jesus, although not easy, is actually the only way to experience true eternal joy. How can you tell me after that story with your daughter and now your grandson, and then your grandson is born, he's this huge gift, and you say, I see how God's working all things together for good, and then three years later, the little boy dies? No! And yet God never left the throne of his heart. He never left his love for Silas or for the daughter or for the mom and the grandmother. And part of our journey of faith is simply saying, I don't know it, it feels weird, it feels upside down, but God's better is what? Church, it's important that we say those things because we don't believe it enough and we're not trying to talk ourselves into belief, we're repenting of our disbelief. We're repenting of the times in our life when life gets hard and Jesus says, hey, I told you there were gonna be storms. I told you it was gonna be difficult. I told you marriage was not easy. And you're gonna be tempted to depart like the masses. 
Jesus doesn't say, that's okay. He says, no, don't. Cling tight. And so today we're gonna go to communion. I wanna invite you in this moment to just, to grab your elements and, and to just stop. And to remember that following Jesus is not easy. It never will be, but it's worth it. It's worth it. In this upside down kingdom, it's worth believing that God's better is better and it's worth stopping and remembering that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the bread of life, that he comes so that we might never hunger or thirst again. And so I wanna invite you right now to just be still and to stop and to receive the bread from above. Communion's a time for us as Christians. If you don't trust and treasure Jesus, I'd encourage you just to skip this part of the service but for us as Christians, it's time for us to stop and reflect and really repent and say, wait a second, Lord, help me in my disbelief. I've done my inventory of my time, my talent, my treasure, and it's not where I'd like it to be. And here's the good news. Jesus doesn't say, okay, you're a fool, get out of here. He says, no, I came to you. In the midst of your brokenness, I pursued you. And so as he gathers his disciples, he doesn't gather a group of perfect saints. He gathers a broken brotherhood that settles for lesser joys, that doesn't believe that God's better is better. And he says, this is what I'm doing for your lack of belief. This is what I'm doing for your lack of faith. This is what I'm doing for your lack of righteousness. I'm giving you mine. So on the night of betrayal, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, take this. Take this body that's broken that you'll never be able to pay. Take my body that will be broken in just a short period of time. Take this in remembrance of him. And then he passes the cup. And, and this is one of my favorite parts of our services. When I hear all you guys opening your cups, this is what community is. A bunch of sinners saying, give me the blood of Jesus. Too many people are gonna walk away. Too many people are gonna give up. Church, don't give up. You cannot accomplish salvation. You can't. We were dead in our sin, but the spirit and the words of Jesus give us life. He says, this is my blood that's given to you, shed for you, covering your doorpost. Bathe in the blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus. Recognize our sin and that we flew upside down, that we drove ourselves into the ground, but God shed his blood to cover your sins. Take this in remembrance of him. And so Jesus, we praise you in this moment. We recognize how each of us have played the role of the prodigal. We recognize that we're either the prodigal or we're the older brother. And the reality is that every one of us has been flying upside down. And yet, God, you entered this world of sin and you took on our shame and our suffering so that you would give us the good life. Never told us it would be easy. But you took the cross and you wore it for me. So Jesus, we praise you. We cast our eyes to the cross this morning. We receive your gift of grace. And we ask that in this moment, you would just meet us in this place, that you would meet us as sinners saved by grace, as saints who still struggle with sin, that, that we would surrender to you, the author and perfecter of the good life. Church, let's respond in song this morning.